What is up, Watch Fam, and welcome to Rent TNH. I'm Christian from Theo and Harris, and today we're going to be doing a collection review uh, from one of our viewers. So before we do so, we'll do a quick wristwatch check on the TGV. So right now, I'm wearing a Rolex 1601 uh, with a taupe dial and a two-tone uh, case, you know, bezel and crown. So I actually, I actually had one of these a couple of weeks ago and sold it to a, you know, to his older client. And I never thought I would really see one of these dials. Maybe not again, but you know, for a long time. And and I stumbled upon another one, which is like a total like fluke. I've been you know buying and you know buying and selling vintage Rolex for uh, two and a half, three years now, and I've only seen you know I think two of these particular dials. So this is a really exciting moment uh, for me in a very very geeky watch geeky way. Uh, this and six, uh, five other uh, new vintage watches will be available on the watch shop at theoandharris.com tomorrow. So tomorrow Tuesday at around 10 a.m. So uh, be sure to check out theoandharris.com then. But apart from that, let's get into today's collection review. Okay, so uh, today we'll be reviewing a, a gentleman named Tony and his uh, his watch collection. I'm going to read you off the, the names of the watches here. Put the list right here. So I'm going to go ahead and read it right now. Uh, Universal Geneve uh, uh, Unicompax Chronograph in yellow gold, circa 1960s. Uh, Je le Coultre Reverso Tourbillon in rose gold. Uh, another Universal Geneve Complete Calendar. Uh, Rolex 16750 GMT, beautiful. Uh, Rolex 1675 in yellow gold, nice. Uh, killer. That's and then a Seiko SKX. Rolex 1803 Day Date in yellow gold. Uh, a Patek Philippe Perpetual Count. Oh, 5140. Love that watch. Uh, Admar Piguet uh, Jumping Hour Minute Repeater in yellow gold. And an A Lang and Zone uh, Langmatic Perpetual in yellow gold. Okay, that is a freaking collection. Wow. Uh, Tony, first of all, uh, congratulations. Obviously, this didn't just happen overnight. I mean, you've been collecting for quite a while. These watches are not necessarily brand new or, you know, just stock. I mean, I know some of these, you know, as far as the Universal Genève, uh, the Rolexes, and even the Langomatic, these are not easy watches to just pick up in a, in a day. I mean, actually, all, even the Admar, I mean, the Admar is probably one of the rarest there. Uh, Overall, I'm extremely impressed with the collection, uh, but it's, we can't just make a whole episode out of how impressed I am by your collection. Uh, I'm going to talk about what I think you should do, or my recommendation, what, you know, how I how I view your state of the collection and what I think you should do. Okay, so let's start off with the Universal Genève uh, little chronograph. So please put a photo of it right here, Anna. Uh, this is a beautiful watch. I genuinely, you know, love vintage chronographs. This looks like a 34 millimeter watch with a really cool dial. It's on a NATO strap. It's very interesting. It goes against the grain in your collection, and it's made by a company who has, you know, received tremendous acclaim in the last couple of years so it's a great watch on its own I would keep it but considering the large scope of your collection my personal opinion I uh, would be to trade it in and, and trade a little up for a different chronograph I would do one in steel uh, for, for rarity and, and the whole tool watch purpose uh, at a, a larger millimeter size um, the, the one of the big gripes that people have with vintage watches and, and you know is the size um, most people don't have you know astronomical amounts of money to spend on watches uh, where they will be able to then afford you know like a vintage universal Geneva at 40 or 41 millimeters those watches are extremely expensive you know you're talking you know 10 15 20 25 30 you know way up into the 50s a hundred thousand dollars so you know these watches of course there are different levels everywhere from uh, brands like record with Roger Pontes uh, Universal Geneva uh, you have everyone from Breitling, and, and there are so many other brands that did make, you know, chronographs back in the day from, you know, Lamania or Valjou or, or whomever. But the watches that I'm talking about, these larger ones, these 40 millimeters, maybe even 38 and up in steel from top brands, finished well, like your Universal Genève, if you were to trade up for that, that to me would be kind of a grail chronograph that most people aren't able to attain, you know, just, I mean, off of pure dollars. These are expensive watches. Uh, so yes, you would have to probably put more money into it and trade up but uh, but I think that that would be a worthwhile addition or you know a substitution in your collection I think it would add a little bit more uh, I think it would just you know kind of tick that uh, or check that you know chronograph a vintage chronograph box a little bit um, I don't know in a more interesting feel in, in a more in a more interesting way once again I love the watch but we're talking about holistically with the collection okay the, as far as the reverso is concerned you have a I mean a, like a ridiculously killer reverso uh, the you know Jaeger La Cultura Jaeger La Cultura has made you know as we all know I mean an unlimited amount of reversos and different variations. You happen to have a Grail reverso. Uh, I don't think I'd trade it. 
I think that to me, that's such an opportunity to own a reverso that, I mean, genuinely, not only do people really not own, but they'll never even see in their lives. Uh, you know, most reversos have the, you know, the plain back that we see on, on, you know, on the street. And of course, you'll get some duos, but to have a tool beyond on the other side uh, and such a finely finished movement to me is just like total next level stuff. And because it isn't square and it's from a, you know, kind of like a different brand like JLC, uh, even though it is a big brand, but still it's a little bit more of an obscure uh, maker. I think that that you know brings just a hell of a lot of interest and, and packs a lot of punch. It's certainly not a cheap watch by any means, uh, but there is value there. So I recommend that you keep that watch. Okay, as far as the uh, the two uh, GMTs, I, I love the GMT. I mean, the sub is a terrific watch, but to me, the GMT holds a more special place. What I think is super interesting about your GMT collection here is, well, one, the condition, especially on the gold one, at least the photo you'll see, uh, it just kind of highlights the condition here. It's totally incredible. But I love how you could have a Langmatic Perpetual or a you know Tourbillon from JLC right next to a GMT with missing loom in the hour hands, I mean, in the, in the pointer. That, to me, is incredible. I know people that, you know, would never expect that uh, you think the person would be a perfectionist, totally refined, you know, you know, end of story, like it has to be perfect. Uh, and I'm not like that. I, I love when things have a little bit more character and you show diversity in your taste. And to me, you've done that. And although that seems like a very simple, like no big deal, oh, whatever, he just bought like a, you know, GMT. To me, that is just uh, an incredible kind of just, you know, reflection of your collection and what you value. It's not just about, you know, precious metals, as you do have a lot in your collection, not just about movements. But here you have a Rolex here, uh, which is, you know, really not all too precious. Taking these other watches into consideration, uh, but a Rolex wheel with some damage, a Rolex that had some wear, a Rolex that truly embodies tool, you know, being a tool, and I love that. I think that I have to give you a big congratulations on that. Uh, on the flip side, with the gold, with the gold model, uh, I think it's beautiful. Um, the, the one obvious thing someone would say is, "Hey, switch it up for a Concord, which would be the straight, you know, the stick hands." But I, I wouldn't tell you to do that. I think that you know, although they're beautiful watches, and if that was a passion of yours, then I you know tell you to go ahead and pursue that. But uh, to me, that's it's just busy work. You know, you have, a, you have a perfect GMT there. You have a perfect 1675. Uh, I don't think that you should trade uh, trade it at all. Uh, if anything, have, have a little bit of fun. Maybe buy uh, a bezel that's a little bit, you know, worn, a little bit ghosted out. I think that that would add some beautiful, purely aesthetic uh, contrast between the black dial and the gold case. Maybe a little bit of a gray bezel, but that would be fun. Apart from that, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on from the GMTs. It's very very cool. As far as the SKX is concerned, um, to uh, totally cool. I mean, I, I get that that's an awesome watch, and people really do. I, I don't I don't have one. I've never really worn one. Uh, if you enjoy it, then then that's awesome. Um, uh, you know, they, it does achieve this very rugged, seriously tool you know function that the GMT did in its heyday. But you probably want to preserve it a little bit better. Uh, I don't know what your daily you know lifestyle is like. Whether you need a watch to take that beating. Uh, but I mean, judging by your, the rest of your collection, I'm thinking that you're probably a little bit more suit and tie than, uh, than construction boots. As far as the day-date is concerned, I think it's an it's absolutely incredible watch. Um, I genuinely, genuinely love day-dates. You have a beautiful example. I mean, the only thing you would you could do if you wanted to, if you ever got bored, was just maybe switch up with you know a different kind of dial, or maybe a wide boy or something like that. But that's once again kind of a busy work thing. Uh, I love it just the way it is. Uh, moving on to a watch that I actually have a big kind of note on here uh, is the Paddock, the 5140. I love the watch. I think it's beautiful. I think that it's interesting that you bought it in yellow gold because most people that I know you know typically prefer it in white. Uh, but I, I actually do like it in yellow. But my biggest question here for you. Uh, and it really is more than a question, a little bit of a suggestion. Why did you take the 5140 over the 3940? I mean, the 3940, it's a, first of all, it's powered by the same, powered by the same caliber. Uh, the 3940, you know, is the grandpa. I mean, it's, you know, it, it was the watch that really, I mean, Terry Stern wears one. Yeah, it was the watch that uh, introduced this idea of these serial, serial produced uh, grand complications. I mean, it's a perpetual. I think that the that the 3940 represents 3940, 3940. 39, 3940. Uh, sorry, I'm a little dyslexic. Uh, it does represent a little bit better value. Actually, I'll go as far as a lot better value uh, for two reasons. One, I happen to like the dial a little bit more, so that's just a preference. I like that the Patek Philippe uh, stamp is a little bit smaller, but much much larger. The price difference is astronomical. I was looking before uh, on, on online, uh, just in a very casual kind of way, and I saw a 3940, I believe a first series model uh, without the Expedition, Expedition case back, uh, selling for $31,000 at Govberg Jewelers. And I don't recommend you buy from them because I'm sure they're overpriced, and I'm sure you can get that watch for, you know, 
a lower price. But just to give you an idea, 31, and I would probably say that's on the high end uh, of that model, compared to the 50, uh, the 5140, which is much more expensive. I'm not sure what you paid, uh, but unless you stole it, uh, you paid a lot more than 31. So I think that personally, the difference in the price between the 3940 um, and the 5140 is so big uh, that we're talking, you know, 15, 20, 30 thousand dollars, depending on you know where you bought it and, and all that kind of stuff. That I think that money, that 10, 15, 20, 30 thousand, could be spent uh, on its own watch. Uh, and I don't think that you'd sacrifice the value uh, in the 5140 at all. I mean, I, think that, I don't think that you're taking a step down. I think you're taking a totally lateral, if not, you know, up step. So, uh, so that's kind of my opinion on that particular watch in your collection. The Edmar uh, Jumping Hour Mint Repeater is probably one of the most beautiful watches I've ever seen. Uh, I have re legitimately no remark about it. All I can say to you uh, is congratulations. That watch is on. Unbelievable! The gothic hands, the black dial, the numerals. The, I mean, then then the most like obscure and under the radar complication that also happens to be like one of the coolest complications in the world in the minute repeater. Uh, for those of you who do not know what a minute repeater is, uh, you know, essentially to put it real short, uh, you basically slide that little lever in the photo or in the little lever right there. You can put an arrow toward it, Anna. Uh, and, and it chimes off the hours and then the quarter hours and the minutes. So, I mean, that, that's just so cool. You know, you just hit it and it's ding, ding, ding. That's it, that, that, that watch to me is absolutely just incredible. Moving on, the Longomatic, uh, I mean, come on. Most, when I saw it in, initially, I thought it was the Datagraph Perpetual. Obviously, it's not, uh, but I don't even see the Longomatic Perpetual often at all. So to me, that added an extra level of just like, oh, wow, like that's, that's really cool that he went with the one I haven't seen so often. Um, I, the, the, the one kind of recommendation that I would, you know, kind of give you is because aesthetically, as far as, you know, color and, and kind of like the prestige and the level of finishing and everything, the Paddock 5140 or 3940, depending on what, you know, if you trade it, uh, is very similar to the Langomatic. I would say maybe, you know, uh, if, if you would be open to, you know, switching up with Langa, staying within Langa, but changing a model, um, I think something like the 1815 chronograph is an incredible option. The first generation that was released in 04 with the uh, pulsometer scale to me is more beautiful than the prior, than the, than the, you know, the recent, you know, generation. Uh, but still, these are incredible watches, the baby data graphs, right? And then the finishing is incredible. Depending on, you know, what your aesthetic preference is, there are several different options. There's, you know, there's gold with a black dial and white subdials. There's, you know, gold on white. There's, you know, white gold on white. And there's so many different options. They're definitely worth looking into. Uh, you don't see them around all that often. Datagraph gets a little bit more love, a lot bit more love. It's a, it's a but to me, it's a more refined watch. It's thinner in diameter. It's not so obtrusive. Uh, but I still love how long it is. It's just like brutally German and like perfect, you know, in every single way. Uh, to me, that's a watch is a, is, is a real joy to look at. If you wanted to get out of Longa, which I don't think that you should, but if you you know wanted to you know do that, uh, I do recommend taking a look at the 5170, maybe even an R in rose gold. If that's kind of if that's something you're into, I believe that your JLC Reverso is in rose gold. So that's to me is a gorgeous, gorgeous watch. The dial, how it plays with the the case and everything, to me is just um, you know it's a work of art. I don't like the 5170 as much as the as much as the 1815. Uh, I just love the um, the I don't know density of the 1815. Uh, but there is a beautiful refinement to the 5170 that I think that you would enjoy. The one other recommendation that I'll make, uh, not to replace anything, but to maybe add if you're looking to invest more money into your collection, I would take a look at maybe the 5167 or the 5164. Uh, this We're talking about Nautilus, I mean Aquanaut now. Uh, the uh, Nautilus is great. I don't know if you necessarily have a need for one in your collection. I think that the Aquanaut would be a really interesting, like real like tool, like take a beating. Uh, and do it in style kind of watch. Um, I think that it's the perfect watch if you're gonna vacation and go in the water, or whereas a lot of your watches currently, apart from the SKX, really shouldn't uh, be too all too close to the pool with drinks. Uh, but that watch to me is really beautiful. The travel time, especially in the, 60, the 5164, uh, is, a, I mean, like really kind of leaves me speechless. I'm not a huge, huge Paddock fan at this point uh, in their collection, but that is probably one of the three or four watches out of their huge collection that really does still interest me. I think that it has function and the function is appropriate
appropriate uh, to the watch, which is something that Paddock has been missing on a lot recently. But apart from that, uh, we're done. Now, that's it. Those are my collection. Uh, those are my collection thoughts. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, if any of you guys have uh, any desire for me to review your collection, please shoot me an email at info at theoandharris.com uh, with the subject collection review, and I will do my best to, I will definitely put it in the queue, and I'll do my best to get to it. But that's it, guys. Be sure to check out the watch shop again tomorrow on theoandharris.com, and, uh, and enjoy.